and we're going to get started with some worship. You guys would all stand with me. I sure hope you know my Jesus, because if you know my Jesus, you got joy in your heart. Amen. Amen. It's good to be here this morning. If you're our guest, welcome. Thank you for joining us. I'm Pastor Jeff. And uh, do me a solid favor. There should be a welcomes card. Welcome card. Excuse me. My wife's over here shaking her head saying, no, welcome card, not welcomes card. Welcome card. Do me a favor. Fill it out, and when the offering goes by, put it in there so that we can reach out to you, minister to you this week. How about we go to the Lord in prayer? Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, we uh, thank you so much for this day. I thank you, Lord, for your presence in this room. And God, we just desire to be a people who hear from you and, and a, a people to, that would just 
be on fire and just want to serve you, Lord. And so as we worship you this morning, I pray that you would accept our worship, Lord. God, we love you. We thank you and you praise you. And we say and ask these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Why don't you say hi to your neighbor? Guys, if you want to come back and find your seats again and remain standing, we're going to continue in our time of worship this morning.
up on me. You never gave up on me. You were my testimony. Oh, you never gave up on me. You never gave up on me. You were my testimony. Tower of refuge and strength Let every breath And all that I am Never cease to worship you Oh, shout to the Lord All the earth let us sing Power and majesty pray to the king mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name I sing for joy at the work of your hands forever I love you forever I'll stand nothing to the promise I have in you. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is not like you. Wonders of you, mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength. Let every breath and all that I am never cease to worship. Sing this out. Oh, shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy.
Uh, but we just uh, come to you and just want to say thank you so much for all the promises that we have in you. And God, we just are so grateful that we are able to have this place of worship. And God, giving is an act of worship. And so I just pray that as we worship you with our offerings this morning, that you would just use every penny to further your kingdom here on earth. We'll give you all the praise, honor, and glory Do your name, for it is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother and sister, for leading us in some worship this morning. There is one of you oh, awake, and so, amen, that God is good. And we are going to have uh, children's church this morning, and so uh, if that pertains to you, then I guess uh, the kids will run out. So, uh, look at them go. Now they're screaming. Brother, we're going to be in Nehemiah chapter 10 this morning, all right? Well, sometimes things change. For you dyslexic people, just know that sometimes things change. Uh, and so we're going to be in Nehemiah chapter 10, and uh, we're going to look at the whole entire chapter, and... Uh, we're going to continue in our sermon series about building walls and building up lives. And so, if you would turn your Bible there and, uh, and stand with me for the reading and honoring of God's Word. And we, we uh, have made it up to this point, and so uh, just bear with me. There's a whole bunch of uh, names in there. Uh, and don't worry, I'm not going to try to stand here and pronounce them for you so that you can make fun of me. And uh, I, I get that enough. And so, uh, verse 28, it says in chapter 10, The rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and all who have separated themselves from the peoples of the land to the law of God, their wives, their sons, their daughters, all who have knowledge and understanding, join with their brothers, their nobles, and enter into a curse. Now, that's something that, that just, you read something like that, and you're like, what in the world? They're like entering into a curse. Uh, and an oath to walk in God's law that was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe all and do all the commandments of the Lord, and our Lord, and His rules and His statutes. You may be seated. Let's give, go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we uh, thank you so much, Lord, for the text this morning. And I just pray that you would just open up our hearts to receive it. God, I pray that we would hear from you this morning. Um, Lord, we desire to... To know you, we desire to be changed by you. God, that's why everybody comes here. We're grateful for every person that comes through the doors of this church building. And God, this is a message for them this morning. So give them ears to hear and, and give them 
a heart of understanding to walk out of this place just changed from the way that they came in. Lord, we love you. We thank you and we praise you. And we say and ask these things in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, I encountered a story about a man at a certain church. And every chance this man had to pray in the prayer meeting, he always ended his prayers with, Lord, can you please clean out the cobwebs? Lord, clean out the cobwebs of my life. One of the church members become irritated after hearing this same prayer request week after week because he saw no change from the man praying, him leaving the prayer meeting week after week. He prayed the same thing, but there was never any change. And so one following prayer meeting... The man uh, began to pray, and he was saying, Lord, clean out the cobwebs of my life. And the church member interrupted him before the guy could say amen, and he said, while you're at it, can you please kill the spider? You see, it is one thing to offer the Lord a passionate prayer, Such as we have heard in chapter 9. Remember, they're in a prayer meeting in Nehemiah chapter 9. But it's a whole different ball game to live in obedience after you say amen, right? We could lift up a passionate prayer. We could call out to God and ask for help. We could seek the Lord through prayer. And and after we say amen, we could go right back doing the same thing that we Just ask God to deliver us from. And so we need to learn about obedience this morning. We need to learn about being committed after we say the amens. Because a revived people are a obedient people. A revived people are a committed people. And in our text this morning, there are three ways that you and I could learn to become a committed and obedient people. People. And the first way that I see in our text this morning, in chapter 10, that you and I could be a committed people is this. We must commit to be all in personally. We must commit and be all in personally and through obedience. And we see this all throughout the list of names that are given in verses 1 through 27. You see, chapter 8 of the book of Nehemiah witnessed a revival breaking out through the proclamation of the Word of God. If you want revival in your own life, if you want a a God to speak to you in your life, then friends, you're going to find it within the pages of the canon of Scripture. Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation. God speaks to us through his word. And so in chapter 8, the people are experiencing a personal renewal, renewal because the Bible was being taught. The Bible was being expounded upon. The Bible was being preached. And from there, we see in chapter 9 that the people begin to become convicted Yes, convicted over their wrong behavior. They were being convicted over the way that they were living their lives. And as that conviction began to stir in their hearts, we see a confessional service going on in chapter 9. They were acknowledging their sin. They were acknowledging that they wasn't living in light of what God had revealed in the Old Testament Law, And then they begin to seek God for forgiveness. I mean, that's what we do when we confess our sin. He is faithful. He is just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen? And so that's what we find in Nehemiah chapter 9. Now, when we get to chapter 10... This reveals these individually individuals actively addressing the issues that they were confessing. Now, have you ever heard that old saying, 
Put your money where your mouth is. I come from the streets. I get it. I got raised differently than most of you. And, and we would say, put your money where your mouth is. Are you all talk? Well, here in Nehemiah chapter 10, we find these people putting their money where their mouth is. They wasn't just a people who were giving lip service. They were literally doing something about their, prayer, or their sin, right? They were doing something that, that, that wasn't just a prayer. They wanted to change. They wanted to personally show that they were all in. And so in chapter 9 and verse 38, if you back up a little bit, notice in verse 38, it says, Because of all this, we make a firm covenant in writing on the sealed document are the names of our princes, our Levites, and our priests. And then in chapter 10, verses 1 through 28, we find 84 people who signed the dotted line and said that we are going to commit to be all in. We are going to commit to be living in light of God's truth. These people were sold out. There was no hit and miss. There was no cold. No, they, they, were, they was hot. They, they wanted to live for the Lord. They were all in and they wanted to to live God's way they were making a commitment to live in light of the truth of God and what I find interesting about these 27 verses is there are four groups that are depicted here in this list this roll call of names and topping that list is a guy by the name of Nehemiah and that is where we get the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah was a, a he was in the, the presence of the king. He was the cup barrier. And his brother came back to uh, where they were in captivity. And he asked what was going on in Jerusalem. His brother told him that the walls were destroyed and the city lie in ruins and the people were feeling great shame and reproach and he got a burden and he began to pray and he began to seek God and God opened up the door for him to come all the way from Babylonian captivity to Jerusalem and in a feat of like 40 to 50 days I forget which which number it was they they built the wall around Jerusalem is 52 days they built the wall around Jerusalem. They had a burden. Then the people started to seek the Lord through the word of God, and they started praying. They started confessing their sin. And Nehemiah tops the list of the person who's saying, I'm going to commit to be all in. You see, you can't expect to commit to being all in until your leaders, the people who are over you in the Lord, are all in themselves. And that's what we find with Nehemiah in verse 1 of chapter 10. He tops the list. Then the second group in verses 1 through 8, we see the priests. Those are the ministers of the Lord. In verses 9 through 13, we see more ministers of the Lord, the, the Levites. And then finally, in verses 14 through 27, we find the rulers or the leaders of the people in verses 14 through 27. Now, you're probably thinking, what in the world does this have to do with me personally? Right? You look, and normally when we read something like this, we just glance at it and don't act like you don't. You just move right through it, right? Well, this has everything to do with us. And here's why God isn't calling us to make a written agreement or sign a dotted line, He isn't calling us to just give lip service to our commitment. God is calling each and every one of us, Golden Avenue Baptist Church, to complete and full surrender to him and his cause. Not one of us can walk away from this room this morning without being challenged to be completely surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, in the Bible, taking an oath 
or making a vow, saying you're going to commit to this or you're going to commit to that, and breaking it is a serious, and I mean a serious, matter. So serious, you're better off not making any commitments if you know you're going to break it. It's okay to be a Mr. No-No man, amen? It, some of y'all get that. That's Michael's, uh, mid, that he says no to everything, right? Don't, don't commit something if you aren't willing to see that commitment through. It's a serious matter. You know, the Bible says in James chapter 5, verse 12, James is like the Proverbs of the New Testament, by the way. It, it, he, he writes this, and he says, Above all, my brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, and so that you may not fall under condemnation. And if you go back on your oath, if you go back on your, your commitments that you made to the Lord, you could fall under condemnation. So let this serve as a warning. Don't make foolish decisions off of your feelings and emotions. Really seek the Lord on your commitments to God. Let your yes be yes and let your no be no. But the text suggests that we find a group of 85, 84 individuals who counted the cost and they were committed to be all in. But it's not just Nehemiah. It's not just James that declares that taking oaths and making vows are a serious matter. But Jesus, the one we gather and worship, the one we desire to serve, and I hope you desire to serve, the one that we get to know who has revealed himself to us in these last days, Jesus even says himself in Matthew chapter 5, verse 34 through 37. Notice what he says. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make your hair white or black, or in my case, you can't make it bald or half hair. Did I say that right? Let what you say simply be yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. We believers, Golden Avenue Baptist Church, should not make foolish oaths to display our commitment to God. Then, then how are we, in light of the truth that has been revealed to us this morning, how are we, how are you personally, each and every single one of us, put your name there, how are we to show that you're committed? How am I to show that I am committed? Well, it's easy. Through loving obedience. Through loving obedience, our relationship with God, think about it, is that of a child to a father. I mean, I want to obey God. I want to I want to do as he says. I want to be like him in character. Why? Because I love my father, my heavenly father. So I desire to live in light of his word. I want to commit to him because I love my father. And basically, God desires you to be committed to him. Because he loves you. He wants our obedience to be based on the foundational principle of love. Love. You know why I know this? Because in John chapter 14 verse 15, Jesus himself says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you, if me, right? It's easy to stand up here and point at you guys because I'm speaking to you, but I like to throw in me too, right? If I love G, if I love the Father, then I'm going to keep, I'm going to do what he says. I'm going to keep his commandments. If you love me. The foundational principle of us being all in is that we love God and he loves us and therefore that love 
will energize us, that love enables us to keep his commandments. This group of people all the way back in the book of Nehemiah is living out this principle. We are committed. We must be all in as well. Number two, the second way that we could learn to be all in this morning because a revived people, a changed people, a person who is filled with God the Holy Spirit are a people who are not only all in, being committed all in, but they are committed to live out the word of God. Because I see this in verses 28 through 31. The Bible has a lot to say about many issues, right? Some of those issues are very positive. They're good things, right? But, but sometimes when we read the Bible, often it calls you out. And it challenge and it's and and you got to change. You it tells you how to live. It tells you how to get right. It tells you how to stay right. It tells you what not to commit to. It tells you what to commit to. And as a revived people, if we are going to be committed to Jesus this year in your life personally, then we have got to be not only all in, but we got to got to stick to the book and we got to follow what God says in His word. We have to commit, church, to living according to the principles that are found within the pages of the Bible. You see, the way that these people in Nehemiah chapter 10 were committed to living out the word uh, was through separation. And here's why I could say that. Notice in verse 28, the Bible says, and all who have separated themselves from the people of the lands to the law of God, right? If you remember, God strictly told these Israelites, have nothing to do with the nations around them. And if, and he gave a warning, if you live in li- and, and associate with these people, this was going to be the results. You are going to be in captivity, And here we find a people that have allowed them to be influenced by the people around them. They were led into captivity, and God warned them. So here in this revival service, the people are going back and doing what God said. They were separating themselves. They wasn't just a group of people who wanted to be a hearer of God's word, but they strongly desired to be a doer of God's word, right? That's what I find in in this group of people. that's, That's about it. That's all I see. Don't forget what James says. The half brother of Jesus in verse 22, who I believe wrote the book of James, says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. That word separated is an important word to our biblical text as we exegete the scripture this morning. You, you, you see this word means to separate from. It means to withdraw from and to separate oneself to another. Don't miss that. The people separated themselves from what God determined which was unclean, which he called evil, which he forbid them to associate with in the first place, and then they begin to separate themselves to what? The law of God. So it was a a calling away, separate yourself from evil and separating yourself to this. To God. And that's, that's how we could determine if we are all in. That's how we could determine if we are really a committed people. If we, we flee from all appearances of evil, and we do, and we live as strongly as we possibly can, and in the power of the Holy Spirit, who gives us the strength to be a committed person to the words of God. 
this community of faith in Nehemiah chapter 10 isn't the only person who desire to shun what is evil, separate that which is, is, is wrong, and commit to what God says is good. King David wrote in Psalms 119, verses 9 through 11, now that I have some attention, how can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart, I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I was reading this this morning, and, and now it's coming back to my mind, that word wonder. There's an old hymn, uh, 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 Count of Every Blessing, you know, my heart's prone to wonder, right? Lord, my heart is prone to wonder. And David and these people, I think they recognize that. I think we could recognize that our heart is prone to do what is wrong. Our heart is prone to wonder from the God I love. And David is passionately praising Jesus. He's he's praying and he's thanking. He's like, Lord, let me not wonder from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. These people, I believe, knew that there should be a distinction between them and the people of the land in verse 28. They knew they shouldn't give their sons and their daughters in marriage and be unequally yoked. Verse 30, they comprehended the importance of observing the day of rest in verse 31. Ultimately, they knew it was a time to commit to living out the law of Moses. Guys, there's a time that we must get to, to where we understand that we must commit to what God says, and and not just the Old Testament, we're talking about the entire Bible. Notice what verse 29 declares, to walk in God's law that was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord, our Lord, and his rules, and his statues. Did you hear? To walk in God's law, to observe, and do all the commandments, his rules, and his statues. And I love that phrase, to walk, right? Walking denotes a direction, right? Each and every single one of us in this room tonight, or this morning, help me Lord, are walking a direction. Some of us are walking the course of this world under the prince and power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. You're walking in the direction as far away from God as you possibly can. Others, and I'm so glad, I know most of y'all in here, we're walking the different direction. We've turned from the standards of the world. We've turned from Satan, and we're walking this way, and we desire to walk in God's law. We want to live in God's statutes. We understand that when we place ourselves under the umbrella of what God has clearly revered in his scripture, that there's blessing, there's peace, there's joy, there's hope, there's God's presence. Thank you, Lord. There's one of you. Amen. I want what she's on. Jesus, isn't it? Amen. That's it. I love that phrase, to walk in God's law. Because when we walk, it means to go. When we walk, it means to move. It means to walk in a general direction. And so here this morning, evaluate where you're walking. Think about that. Where are your feet taking you? We are called, church, to walk according to God's word. We are called to go in the way God's word has clearly established. 
And if you were here on Wednesday night, for the past couple of weeks, we've been looking at education and about the Baptist faith and message. And what does that mean? And it, it's just some fancy jargon to, that, that as a church, we have discipleship, we have personal study, we have preaching, we have teaching, right? Those types of things. And King David was like this in Psalms 24, or excuse me, Psalms 25, verse 4 and 5. Make me to know your ways. I want to know God's ways. You want to know God's ways. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. We got to first commit to be all in ourselves. Then, once we've committed ourselves to the Lord and we're all in, we allow the Lord to use us. Then it's it's only evident that 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 we align ourselves up with what God's word says. And chapter ten of the book of Nehemiah is exactly what's going on here. Now, there's a third way. This morning, that could show us if we're all in, if we're really committed. It goes back to that saying, put your money where your mouth is. Help me, Lord. The Bible calls us to be partakers, not just spectators. Okay? These people here in chapter 10, not, not only were spectators of the grace of God, but they were partakers of the grace of God. You see, they saw God do a miracle in rebuilding the wall in 52 days. They saw the revival breaking out in chapter 8 by the proclamation of God's word. They saw people confessing their sins, getting right with with God. They, They saw that. They saw it. They were spectators of it. But more importantly, they personally partook in it. Each one of them was was experiencing the blessings of God. Each one of them was experiencing God's presence. We should all, church, desire to partake in building people up for the glory of God. I, 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 I love that God has given us so much great things to do with such a little body of believers, and he has. But there is nothing more exciting than seeing people radically changed by the power of the gospel. There's nothing like it. I would take your life being changed, your life being built up for God's glory, more than seeing the, build, the biggest building built ever. God wants us to be good stewards of what he's given us. But more importantly, God wants us to be good stewards of each other. God wants to see you built up for the glory of God. And what I recognize in the book of Nehemiah is, yes, there was a building program. But, but it wasn't just the building of a, don't worry, man, I'm not going to swing off the thing. Or I saw your eyes get big or something. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> It wasn't just about building a building or the walls around Jerusalem. It was about people and people being built up for God's glory. And so we can't get about, we're not trying to keep up with the Joneses. We don't need to keep up with the other churches in town. Help me, Lord. Never forget this lesson here in chapter 10. We must be about building people up for the glory of God. Regardless of who they are, regardless of what they've done, we must be about building people up, man. Woo! There's my pep talk for the day. Think about this. Theologically, Christianity isn't a spectator sports. 
You don't just get to sit on the sidelines or in the stands while everyone else carries the burdens. Please hear me. Those of us who have genuinely committed our lives to the Lord and are obediently walking in the principles found in the precepts of the Word of God, no, God calls us to all take part in the ministry's work. Therefore, what does it look like to do the work of the ministry? There's different passages, different places in the Bibles that show us what it looks like to do the work of the ministry. But because I am a I expositionally preach the Bible and teach the Bible. That just means verse by verse, line upon line, book by book, book. Generally, I will allow the Bible to speak what that is as I come to it. And so here in verses 32 through 39, the way that the people in the community of faith in Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah in Jerusalem, the way that they supported the ministry, the way that they uh, did the work of the ministry, true to the text, is through financial ways. It's in verse 32 through 39. And first and foremost, notice all the reference to the temple regarded giving. In verse 32, for the service of the house of our God. In verse 33, for all the work of the house of our God. In verse 34, bring it into the house of our God. Verse 35, to the house of the Lord. Again, in verse 36, to bring to the house of our God. Do you, do I get the point yet? I don't think so. Therefore, in verse 37, to bring to the chambers of the house of our God. Verse 38, we find shall bring up the tithe and the ties to the house of our God. Finally, look at the end of verse 39. The scripture says, We will not neglect the house of our God. How many of us this morning, look, and I'm going to say this, I don't need to know what you make, I don't care what you make, I don't care if you give a lick to this church, because this, this church doesn't depend on your, on your money. It doesn't. But if Jesus is the Lord, and it's very rare that I even speak about money in this place. If Jesus is the Lord over your life, then that means he's the Lord over your time. All your time. All your talents. And all your treasure. And the way that you spend your time... Your ta- use your talents, spend your treasures, genuinely show if he is your Lord or not. And I'm not just talking about money here. These people gave themselves. They were committed themselves to the house of God. They were committed to using their gifts and their abilities Some were priests, some were singers, right? And we've seen this as we've gone through the book of Nehemiah. Others gave financially. Everybody had a part to play. And in verse 31, if we look at that word neglect, which is vital to the text because it means to leave, it means to abandon, it means to forsake, and yes, it even means to apostatize. When you neglect using your time, your, your, your treasure, your, your, your talents for the house of God, to the glory of God, it's as if you are apostatizing. And last time I checked, boy, I don't want to be an apostate. But that's what it's like. It's serious. All I want to tell you is don't fail to give God your time. Don't fail to give God your talents. Don't fail to give God your treasures. Do not abandon. 
Do not forsake your church home by not using your time, talents, and treasures first here. The people in Nehemiah committed to the Lord by taking part of the temple work. So we as God's people are challenged and should commit to the Lord by participating in the ministry's work here in your church home. How should we take part in this work? How should we do this ministry? Well, first, there has to be an unapologetic and unadulterated desire. First and foremost, there's got to be a want to, right? Do you want to be here this morning? Do you want to worship the Lord? Do you want to... Do you want to see people reached in West Springfield and beyond? Do you, do you want to see people get, get saved and discipled? Do you want to see addicts set free by the gospel of Jesus Christ? Do you want to see groceries given to people and people to pray for and, and somebody who's struggling, literally struggling for a hand up, not a hand out, cry on your shoulder? Do you desire to see these things? I mean, I do. I do, I desire to do it. That's the fuel that keeps the fire burning inside, baby. Woo! It is, and my legs just buckled and danced a little bit. But this isn't just Don King's word. Because in verse 32, we also take on ourselves. That speaks of a desire. You see, inwardly to take on the work of the Lord. Do you have a desire to do these things? Do you have a desire to serve in the nursery? Do you have the desire? God loves a cheerful giver, man. The church was just given a ministry truck so we could do the work of the ministry, man. And and, and I'm telling you, there's got to be a desire first and foremost. But... The desire could only take us so long and so far. There has to be an obligation. There has to be an obligation because in verse 32, notice what it says. We also take on ourselves the obligation. Then in verse 35, it says, we find these words. We obligate ourselves to bring. There's a desire, but there's also an obligation. It's the same side, of, or flipping the core, what is that saying? You get this, you know, anyways, we'll move on from that. I embarrassed myself. But listen, you get the point. There is a desire and an obligation. And when we look at that word obligation, you know what that means? It's a charge. You have been given a charge to not only bring yourself to the church house, but you have been charged from God's word to use your talents in the church house. You have been charged to give to the church house for the glory of God. You have been obligated. You have been charged. So inwardly, we need to understand we have all been obligated to partake in the work of the ministry. We are to give our time and our talents and, yes, even our treasures out of a desire and an obligation. So, as I close this morning, and I invite the music team back up to lead us in a time of invitation. All this talk about commitment. All this talk about desire and obligation and being all in, right? Don't check out on me. Listen to me. I can't help but think of Jesus when you really get down to it. His commitment was shown by leaving the portals of heaven, coming to this earth, dying on a cross for your sin. Jesus did what no other man could do. And that was living out everything within the pages of the Bible. Jesus himself was the fulfillment of the law of Moses. Jesus gave it all. He gave his life for you 
and me. The least we could do is this. Commit to him today. Commit to living out the principles of his word. And commit to partake in the work of the ministry. Because remember, church, he gave it all for you. You stand with me. I believe in responding to God's word. Remember chapter 8, chapter 9, those people got convicted. They were, they were convicted over the word as it was read, and then they responded. And so if God this morning has convicted you about something, that's between you and him. You, you do business with Jesus this morning. Well, maybe you need to, to be saved. You don't know. You want to know that when you leave this earth, that Christ will get you to heaven. Maybe you want to give your life to Jesus this morning. Well, come to me. We'll have somebody pray with you and open the Bible with you and show you what it means to be all in, to be surrendered, to be saved, set free. That's you. You come. Father, we come to you. And we thank you, Lord, for your word. God, in a space this large, Lord, and a room this filled, God, you know our hearts better than we do. And you're pressing upon people's hearts to, to give their life to you tonight or today and to be saved and to surrender. And I pray that they would, they would come forward and, and be saved. And Lord, maybe we're not as all in as we think we are. And you're calling us to get right and make a fresh commitment, Lord, to you through loving obedience. Between you and them anyways, Lord, and so pray that we would find grace, mercy, and forgiveness at this altar this morning. That we want to find condemnation, accusation, but we would release all that stuff to your son Jesus this morning. We say and ask these things in Jesus' name. God's people said, God spoke to your heart, you come.